Hello lovely people. This is Alan Mearns here. Um, just doing a wee tutorial for the song This Will Only End In Tears from my album Love Is Covered In Dust, the Yes The Raven album. Um, just a wee heads up. I mean, some of you might be into the songs, some of you might be into the classical stuff, and you might not like one or the other. So in the future, when I do um, a video it's about like popular music. Um, I'll wear my hat, right? Because I wear different hats. And if I'm doing the classical stuff, I will remove the hat. And, uh, so, just in case you're disturbed by seeing something that's that you're not into. Um, so uh, let's talk about this song a wee bit um, off the cuff. It was funny actually, yesterday I was teaching a composition lesson to uh, one of my students, Nick, and I told him, um, you know, go and try and learn something by ear, like a classical piece, you know, just trying to listen to it, try and connect with it. And he came into the, uh, you know, the teaching studio and, and he started playing like the Mozart, Lacrimosa. I should take my hat off here. Just kidding. Um, you know, and it's got this amazing orchestra part that um, he, Mozart makes, like the orchestra weep, kind of. And, uh, and we were just talking about this lacrimosa thing. And then after he left, I was like, let me, people are going to be asking about this. Uh, this will only end in tears song. I have to I go and learn my own song and figure out how to play it because I haven't played it in ages. Um, not sure if I even played it live in any of shows. Um, but so I was listening to it and then I realized I'd forgotten that at the end of it there's like a wee string section that actually quotes, you know, the Lacrimosa, the Mozart thing from the Mozart Requiem. So I thought it was a funny little, you know, coincidence from the universe. So here you go. This is your destined tutorial. Um, let's talk a wee bit about the picking pattern first. Um, it's a very kind of basic thing, and if you go back to the other tutorial videos, in one of the finger picking tutorials, um, there's one called the most useful pattern, and that this is what's kind of basically going on with this song in the right hand. So it's a back and forth thing. Um, so if you if you're not familiar with that, um, maybe have a wee catch up with that video. And uh, so I use this pattern a lot as like a default if I don't have like a different idea, you know, when I'm writing a song. And it's and it's very easy to use because you it kind of has this alternating bass. You get the kind of Johnny Cash bass, right? fingers in core position, you know, the index finger on the G string and the middle finger on the B string. And then you can make it slightly fancier by alternating the middle finger with the um, annular finger, your A finger, on the first string. So you get something like this. So on that ricochet note, that's what I'm. That's what's getting the echo of the melody. That's kind of in the chords. So it's going. You hit the ground like an angel, still undecided. Which team you're on? You mix the trials with some water to hide your weakness. So it's mostly just these three, and then the occasional. When I go up to the, fir the uh, first string, the E string, I use this one. So it's kind of hitting the, uh, echoing the melody kind of on the lazy upbeat. So uh, that's the general right hand pattern. Um, if that's not clear enough, um, you just kind of let me know and I'll try and give you a more explicit answer, you know. Um, so the chords are quite basic, you know, so it's the capo, um, and I'm, it'll sound like it's a D minor, but I'm using uh, kind of A minor, it's a basic key, is A minor shapes, 
and uh, I think in Rick's studio I added like a Nashville gu tuned guitar if I'm I can remember I'm not quite yeah, I think it was I think it was he has like a wee Nashville tuned guitar and to me and it's kind of ends up sounding like a 12 string eventually I think so the chord sequences the harmonies are just a very basic kind of uh, trope at first they go through uh, the circle of fifths you know type thing so if I play the chords in root position on uh, the first part of the verse it'll go something like this like A minor and then D you know so A minor being you know fifth away from the D root and then D being the fifth of G and then G being the fifth of C right so it's and then C being the fifth of F but then I kind of go in reverse F back to C you know um, so it goes uh, but then what happens is to, to make the bass notes a bit smoother um, I'm using inversions of some of those chords just to make the voice leading a bit stronger so instead of you know that kind of thing I have this so it's A minor and going down to F sharp in the bass and then I'm, I'm kind of fingering that uh, inverted D chord like this and then I have this finger ready to play the seventh of the chord or the C just to follow the vocal line more you hit the ground like an angel there's a wee bit of a suspension I guess there too you hit the ground like an angel and then instead of going to the C in root position it's in first inversion that means the third is in the bass E in the bass do these inversions like this and you put the third in the bass and you you're kind of um, pushing the tension of a leading tone of sorts you know so the leading tone the F sharp in this chord has to go to the G you know you're you're kind of forcing the issue harmonically and then I'm doing the same thing here so when you put chords in inversions and first positions you, you, you kind of have to go where they want to go but you're also up in the ante of the emotional uh, poignancy of it because they have a kind of an instability you know they have this kind of like emotional um, they're, they're emotionally pregnant you know and then it has to go to the F and then it goes uh, G to F so let me just go over that again then with the inversions, you know, cycle of fifths. Um, you hit the ground like an angel, going to G, and then C in first inversion, still undecided, F, not the bar, just the, the, uh, the thickest four strings, and then back to C, first inversion, G, which team you're on? First time it just goes to F. And then um, the second part of the, the verse goes like this. See him, except at the end. Okay, so what I do is a wee trick there to kind of get me into B minor, you know, of sorts to kind of do a little bit of a Chopin trick, I would say. Um, so I have the G chord, and because G kind of rings and half the guitar is the G chord, it allows me to move to the next chord, very legato and smooth, and to keep those uh, notes ringing, and almost like you have a pedal on your piano. So if I go, So what I'm doing is I'm creating like a false 
a false new 6 chord going into this new dominant chord, this new 5 chord. The 5 chord of B minor, you know, relatively B minor, not a literal B minor with a capo. So I'm going into that F sharp shape to set up like a B minor thing, right? Um, so it's just a wee surprise, you know, when there's strophic songs like uh, Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, um, things that don't really have choruses, so to speak. Uh, I just like to keep do something that kind of has like a wee a harmonic surprise to keep interest. Um, but I'm not thinking about that when I'm writing it. It's just kind of occurring to me. Um, but that's, I guess, what I want. So it goes into F sharp major there. Again, not a bar chord. So the, the B keeps kind of ringing, which we want. And then, like, um, like Chopin does a lot, um, like Chopin does a lot, I am not giving you just the B minor chord. Um, I'm implying the B minor chord. What I'm actually doing is a G chord in first inversion, which is like a B minor chord just with the F sharp going up to G. So B minor, G in first inversion. Be careful there, I nearly give you a rude sign. So I go from this, you know. this point um, so you can see that shape all right so B open G D you know with a capo and a G there on the first string and then I'm changing my picking pattern to increase like maybe instinctively like a sense of urgency um, so instead of the back and forth thing I'm not doing that I'm the bass note a bit like in that song breathe you know so the thumb is boom 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 like a bass player kind of up in the ante a wee bit and then I do this wee kind of descending trope where the G uh, string the open string is it maintains a kind of a consistent note that doesn't move this is one of the wee tricks I'll talk a lot about in your songwriting and uh and in your just your sense of harmony and good voice leading, the idea of something staying and other things moving. Um, if the like the less you move in your chord sequences, shift around, the more you'll move people, right? So the less you move, the more you move. An obvious example is or this. spaghetti and a sweater already um so that's just moving one fret and two note chord but it's actually very moving it gives you this kind of rocky feel and a, like a lot of that um 80s type stuff so the less you move the more you move people in their hearts and so you'll hear stuff like this when you watch a movie and a good composer will be just good really good voice leading right that's what voice leading means. It means just not moving unless you have to. So this G note, or this um, capo G note, is going to stay. And then what I'm going to do is this is going to descend. Okay, so for those first three chords, the this is staying. This little kind of descending chromatic trick um, that uh, so that's like a Chopin mazurka where he does that kind of thing, you know. And uh, a lot of composers like to do those. When you have sixths like that, you can really move them quite a lot. About sixths are just um, a third with the third and the underneath. 
and it's um it's kind of like a really beautiful third you know like a cello and a viola nice spacing and you can really shift them about and move them and they sound really good you know so on the guitar they would be like this <laughs> See, that's not even a flipping six. That's a tenth. I apologize. Um, this is the six. Um, so this is the tenths are moving anyway. Triads that are spread out, and you give them a wee bit of space. Um, if you keep something the same, you can move the other stuff. So it goes down like that. And then on this chord. with an E on the fourth string. So it's an E minor in first inversion. G in the bass, E, B, and E. And then there's kind of like a, I guess kind of like a F sharp minor seventh with a suspension note. Kind of a melodic inner. And this is the part of the jigsaw puzzle that's going to get me back to my A minor world. Okay, so this is just one fret away from the F major 7th chord I need, which will be the 6th chord in A minor. So you see... The same way I used a wee trick to get into B minor, so to speak. I'm using a wee trick to get back into A minor. And uh, I don't really remember if there was a lot of thought in that or it was more kind of instinct than just my ear, you know. Um, maybe inspiration. I'm not really sure. I wrote this song a very, very long time ago in a different life, in a different world. <laughs> So that happens, I think, a couple of times through, and uh, and then there's a wee bit of a difference in the last verse, um, where at the end of it, um, I do the same wee Chopin descending chromatic thing in A minor, um, capo A minor as well. Um, I'm trying to remember how that goes. Um, <laughs> So it, so it goes. Um, to 
G sharp. So yeah, so I keep the F on there. The D's go down to the open strings. Right? Fourth fret, fourth string, third fret. And then the two open strings. And then I have this. Right, it's kind of an inversion of a um, E flat chord. And then we have an inversion of a B flat chord with the F and the bass. Very complicated. Must have been smart when I was younger. And then this affords me my trick to get back to an E7. A dominant chord of A minor, you know, which is like a little portal back to A minor. So I'm on this B flat major seven inversion, or you know, I guess it's a D minor inversion actually. Yeah, it's a D minor inversion. I'm sorry. Um, I've been I haven't been sleeping very well recently with all this excitement because of this. So you see how this has given you. And I, and I think of leading tones as can go at either direction. They can come from above or underneath. And these are the kind of things that we learn when we play guitar a lot. We look, we kind of see them. We start to see them as connected. Like, okay, I can see that E7 is, is close to this. Right? times as long as you have like a shared note a common tone you can make all kinds of beautiful moves I mean some of them might be a bit too strange for a pop song this one's flirting with um, that area uh, <laughs> but you know just more creative ones you maybe you've heard in like a Radiohead song maybe or something like that um, and because you've got that uh, common tone it, it just keeps it like a, a thread to hold on to and it makes the the next chord tenable even if it's going into a different harmonic area so that's a good wee trick to mess around with in general when you're writing songs it's like can I move as little as possible and see if I can find an unusual chord move and then so that E7 there E G sharp it's another reason why it's good to f kind of finger pick stuff is because you don't have to play the whole clunky chord that you're used to learning when you're a beginner. You can just choose the right notes that you want and just only pick those strings. Um, and then we're into the territory um, of the coda, just the wee ending part. It's only in tears. And then I go to a C7. Which is the it's like a secondary dominant. It's the the five chord of something else, you know. So it's something John Lennon would do a bit, you know. Sometimes. So it's taking you into the F major seven. This so it goes. Um, this about to hear that again. This so I'm kind of going from that six chord to seven chord in A minor to the home chord. Okay. This
at the end, I'm just doing rolled chord, A suspended into A minor, and then I'm pulling off into the C and the E, and I'm doing the wee octave harmonic by touching an octave above this note and pluck them. That's like a wee classical trick. I actually discovered it when I was, um, before I played any classical guitar I'm, when I was a kid in Belfast, just sitting in my bedroom messing around with the guitar. Because the guitar was my toy, you know. I still don't play computer games very well. Um, I just watch my nephews and my sons play there. I like watching movies these days. But the guitar just held my fascination, you know, and I was always trying to find wee secrets and stuff, so never stop doing that, no matter what your age is, you know, you gotta keep your sense of wonder. Because this is just this amazing thing, right? Like this big piece of wood, strings on it. And you can train your fingers to express your heart through it, you know, what a miracle. So the coda, um, sorry for waffling there, the coda goes C7, F major 7, Okay, so um, hopefully that'll help you out a wee bit. Um, I've got some things coming up I'm going to release. I'd just really like to thank you all again for your kind words and support. It means a lot to me and my wee family. You know, I've got a couple of kids going into college, you know, and my, uh, <laughs> my son, at one point, you know, we all thought he would be like... Uh, an engineer or an architect or something he's got like a great kind of mathematical brain but during the uh, pandemic I kind of give him a wee charge him and my daughter I was like listen during this pandemic shutdown thing when you're not at school we're not going to be staring at our phones all day so you're going to have an hour limit like one hour to do all the BS stuff on your phone the rest of the time I want you to learn you know read a book or talk to each other or uh, learn an instrument you know or draw kind of old world skills and uh, so sure enough they did it my daughter's a really good wee artist you know she loves animation and stuff and my son just decided to uh, learn piano I'd actually bought this piano for my daughter for her birthday because she's a wee bit of a songbird and uh, Dorian my son um just started like I've got to teach myself how to play the piano before you know it you know he was playing Furelies and then he was playing the, the third Chopin Nocturne and and then it just started going crazy and now he's like he's decided that he wants to be um, a struggling musician like me you know <laughs> he's playing like all this Bach and they were actually going to do a wee concert together on Father's Day which would be brilliant down at the White Horse in Black Mountain here in North Carolina so um, it's kind of a crazy turn of events, you know. So he was he was basically my retirement plan before, you know. He thought he was going to be a very successful um, engineer or something, but now he's going to be like a you know musician like his dad. So I really value um, you guys adding just a sense of uh, I don't know how to describe it, just a real sense of dignity and a real blessing to this uh, stuff that I do. And hopefully it'll be of some use to you and uh, really good news there recently like um, the, the classical record the Bach record it actually started charting because of you guys on the bi classical billboard chart so it's really bizarre times you know and, and all that time I've been spending in the last four years working on the Chaconne has been really good um, so uh, I have another uh, classical thing coming up. I'm going to do a wee interview with my teacher. 
So if you're not into the classical stuff, you might want to avoid that. <laughs> if that if, but if you know if you're not into it just because it's uh, boring, you can put it on sure and um, you can fall asleep. It'll help you fall asleep. <laughs> Sometimes I do that. I put on a documentary if it makes me fall asleep. And uh, if you uh, want a CD, you can buy CDs uh, at alanmerns.com. Um, even if you don't have a CD player, sure they make a really nice set of coasters. You know, so if you have mugs and you want to get a put it on a coaster. That's great for that. And I'm selling the, the Bach edition of the scores and the arrangements. And you can get that through alanmerge.com too. Um, and you also get it through Amazon. Um, and if, even if you don't read music, that make if you just cut those pages out, it makes like amazing wallpaper. Yes, yeah, so it makes really pretty wallpaper, written music. So anyway, we'll, we'll keep you posted and um, I'll keep uh, doing these wee videos. and. Just let me know what you want to know in the uh, comments too, and I'll try and address those things as I can. And again, a big heartfelt thank you, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.